Hello! We're going to be working on a tax return today. I hope you all have installed your H&R Block software. Um, this is going to be the software we're using to prepare all the tax returns in the course. So I'm going to do an initial run through of a tax return with you so you can kind of see the um, how to input things in the software and what you should be looking for when you're preparing tax returns for your assignments. Um, I'm going to give you a little disclaimer. The H&R Block software is something I, I don't use a lot. It is actually a, a consumer-based tax software, so you'll notice that it's for individuals who want to prepare their own tax returns and asks lots of questions. Um, what, as a tax professional, I have a much different software, software that I use, which um, gives me a little bit more flexibility. So bear with me as we work through this, but I. I do want to kind of give you some exposure so you can kind of see <clears throat> what you have to look forward to. Um, HR Block probably did give you an activation code, which you can put in if you like. Um, I'm going to skip it for now because we aren't going to be e-filing any returns, so we don't need that. And also right here, HR Block may be doing updates occasionally on their software. That's because um, tax rules are constantly changing, and so if there is a tax rule that has um, changed, H&R Block will update it here, and you can click on this button to update your software so that you make sure your return is getting all of the accurate <coughs> calculations and figures based on the most up-to-date tax rules. We're going to go ahead and start a return, though, and the tax return we're going to do together here on this tutorial is from Chapter 3 of your 2017 Individual Income Tax textbook. Um, it's cumulative problem number 55 on page 3-51. So I'd recommend you following along um, and maybe pull out your software as well and so you can kind of see how things are going to work out here. Um, so we don't need to browse anything. We're starting entirely new. So we're just going to kind of skip through here. <clears throat> we don't want to import anything. And so this is where it starts. It's going to start asking questions about you, or in this case, the, ta the taxpayer that we're preparing a tax return for. Um, and there's lots of things that aren't going to be applicable, so you can pretty much just kind of skip through them. Um, so there's lots of questions here. And so filing status. They want to know the filing status of the tax person, the, the taxpayer that we're preparing a return for. The taxpayer is Logan Taylor. <coughs> And as it indicates in the problem, he is a widower. His wife Sarah died on June 6, 2013. And we're preparing the 2015 return for him. So as you learned in Chapter 3, um, a individual who's lost their spouse who does have dependents qualifies as a um, qualifying widower basically gets the same tax benefits as if he were he or she were married um, for two years following the death of their spouse as long as there's a dependent child in the home and we're going to read in this um, problem that Logan actually does have um, a dependent child in his home so he qualifies as a qualifying widower and this is going to be since his wife died in 2013 2014 was the first year he could claim this status and 2015 will be the second and last year he can claim this filing status. So that would be something we want to let him know that um, starting in 2016 he would probably be filing under a different status. We have that and this is where we're going to put in all of his information. Let's see if we can get this. And the problem will give you all of the information you need. And it's extremely important that <coughs> despite whether or not I'm very accurate here, that when you are preparing a tax return, you are putting exact information in, especially social security numbers and that. 
type of information. The problem gives us all of this information that we need, his personal information, indicates to us that he is a paralegal. And all this information I'm putting in comes straight from the problem in the textbook on page 3-51, it's problem number 55. And I'm strictly going to be, and your assignments will be revolving around federal returns, so the fact that he's not an Arizona resident has no um, relation to what we're going to be doing, and also this state refund over here won't matter for him as well because we're just focusing on federal. Okay, so I think we have most of his personal information in here. If I forgot anything, we can always come back and look at it at the end when we review. Okay, so he was a full year resident there. We're going to skip this phone number for now. And this is going to pop up. It says, do you want to save your return? I would highly recommend that you save your return. You don't want to lose any of the work that you've been doing. Okay. We're giving you an opportunity to review the information again. The only thing here I think that's going to be applicable is special situation. I want to designate $3 to the Presidential Election Campaign Fund. Um, it says specifically in the problem, I think it's at the very end, that Logan does not want to contribute to the Presidential Election Campaign Fund. So. If it said that he did, that's where we would mark that box, but he doesn't, so we're moving on. They want to know the year his wife passed away. We know that's 2013. Now we need to add some dependents. And as we learned in this chapter, that's going to be um, one of the main things that sometimes is difficult to determine is whether or not somebody living in the taxpayer's home or whom they're supporting qualifies as a dependent. Here we learn about Logan that his mother, Helen, is living with him and she is age 70 and it says she receives a modest social security benefit. Because of her age she wouldn't qualify as a qualifying child, however if she's just receiving social security income then she doesn't have any taxable income therefore she can actually be um, claimed as a qualifying relative as long as she's living with him and he's paying for um, her support. So she is going to be one of his dependents. We want to get her information in here. We want to know who she is. She. We're going to just go with the parent here. <clears throat> and this information is so the H&R block can typically help you determine whether or not they're dependent. So if you were to skip this line, for example, um, you probably aren't going to have any issues. Okay, so then we can verify her information and let's add another dependent. The problem also indicates that Asher Taylor, um, Logan's son, lives with him and that he is a full-time student in dental school and earns $4,500 as a part-time dental assistant. He's 23, so because he's a full-time student and he's under age 24, he qualifies as um, a dependent, so we will add him in. It's important that we go through each of these um, people who are listed as members of his household to determine if they actually are dependents. There's going to be lots of scenarios when you're preparing taxes for people and they think that, you know, anyone who came and spent the night at their house any time during the year should be their dependent. and. Well, that's just not the case according to IRS rules. So, this is his son. And because he's a full-time student, it doesn't matter that he wasn't actually living in his house because he was away at college. But he meets the other requirements. Oh, they want to know this. We're going to say, um, child, live with you because... Even if he's away at college, it's deemed that he, he does live with him. So they, they're now questioning this. He's over 18. Um, does he provide over half of his own support? Was he a full-time student? Yes, he was. Okay, and we have one more dependent that we're going to add, and that's Mia Taylor. Um, it doesn't indicate that she is a student. However, and because she's over 18, 
and she's not a full-time student, she wouldn't qualify as a dependent if she had um, income for the, the standard deduction limit. However, it says here that she didn't work. So because she had no income, she qualifies also as his dependent. Okay, this is his daughter. None of those apply to Mia. Okay, so we have all the dependents in together. Now, um, as you go along and you're inputting information, if you would like to see whether or not um, the information you've input is hitting the tax form in the proper way, which I highly recommend you do, you'd come up here to forms and you can select the form that you know the information should be on. In this case, we know that this information needs to be on the form 1040. So we can look here and see that we did put all of Logan's information in okay. It marked him as a qualifying widower. And we have all of his dependents in here. So, so far so good. Another quick trick I want to show you is anytime, and you can look out however you like, but I think that it starts to get cluttery when they add these mini worksheets in here. So I like to hide the mini worksheet. That way it shows the tax form the actual way it looks. If you need to verify a calculation or something, you could open up the mini worksheets. But whenever you're submitting anything to me, please, please, please always hide the mini worksheets because it just makes your document so much longer. Triples the length of your tax return. Okay, so we know that that's in there good. We can close that. It'll take us right back to where we were. And we're finished entering in dependence.